He's a foreign associate of the US National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences. Um, and just, I've selected a choice number of other roles he has um, because he has a very long CV. Um, he's the president of the Friends of Oxley Creek Common and a patron of the Friends of Sherwood Arbitorium, um, chair of the Environment Institution Advisory Board for Adelaide University, chair of the TURN Advisory Board, Chair of the Advisory Board of Coral Reefs and the Centre of Excellence and the Director on the Board of BirdLife Australia. So um, we might go pass on to Hugh now to deliver his seminar. Thank you very, very much, Alice. Hopefully everybody can hear me. My um, internet connectivity is not perfect because um, I don't have a UQ computer and uh, I'm using the visitor internet so is every is it are you hearing me put up your thumbs or thumbs yeah, down you if you're hearing me moderately well in real real time good um, if things go badly people might need to scare us turn off their screens um although it is nice to see some faces so when you start scowling or crying or getting angry or beating your fist then i know things are going badly with the talk uh so thanks everybody for joining online. It would be nice to be doing this face to face. And I also realize that lots of people are away for Easter, um, which is good. Um, let me begin by trying to share my slides and my screen. But while I'm sharing my screen, um, I'm gonna do two things. Uh, one is uh, acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the place in which we all sit, which here is the Yagra and Turrbal people. And of course, um, in some senses, in many senses, they are the original scientists and stewards of the place where we are. So the landscape we see is very much a function of all the work they did over 50,000 years. And unfortunately, of course, a lot of the indigenous knowledge is being lost, but there's many efforts to uh, co-manage all over Australia. Um, Secondly, uh, I have a new uh, thing that I like to insert in my talks. You can tell me later offline whether you think it's a sensible thing to do or not, or what form of words it should take, other than acknowledging the traditional owners. In this day and age, um, I think it's sort of worthwhile reminding everybody that the world is not equitable in any possible sense. And as a Australian white uh, male, and various other things in front of that. I enjoy enormous privilege, and I just like to acknowledge all the privileges I've had uh, in my life. So what I'm gonna talk about is actually, what's the point of science in conservation? So many of the people on this call are interested in conservation. Um, I'm gonna particularly be talking about the objective of delivering outcomes for nature. So I'm interested in outcomes for nature. Uh, conservation biology, which is a science that I suppose has evolved over the last 50 to 60 years and really has taken off enormously in the last 20 years. There's now an enormous number of people who call themselves conservation scientists, conservation researchers, sometimes conservation biologists. Um, they are all doing science, uh, I assume, for the purpose of delivering outcomes for nature. That said, uh, many of the people who now call themselves conservation biologists are really biologists or ecologists by training. And my feeling over the last 20 or 30 years is much of what they do is still asking basic questions, which is good about the way the world works. And this, uh, talk is all about whether that's the most useful use of our time, if the outcome is nature. If you just like science and you want to work out the way the world is, which is a very valid activity and heavily underfunded, then this is not the talk for you. If your purpose is or your objective is largely to deliver outcomes for nature, then the question is what kinds of science and monitoring should we do? So this is going to sound a little bit like an anti-science talk, I do like science, but I do love nature. Okay, there's a difference. Science to me is a means to an end. And so I'm very interested in doing science that makes a difference. 
and how do you work out what makes a difference? So this is going to be sort of a fairly rambly talk, but I'm going to start off with some stories to illustrate my point. And again, some of these stories may be offensive. Um, so the first one is a story about seven years ago, uh, before I was the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy, uh, a group of people from the Nature Conservancy who were in Mexico near La Paz, and they had a couple of marine protected areas in the Gulf of uh, California, uh, a bit on the western side of Mexico, which has enormous diversity. And they had these marine protected areas that were being designated by the Nature Conservancy and were co-managed with state and local authorities. And they said, well, Hugh, we want to have a monitoring strategy because we're interested in the impact of climate change on the species in our marine protected area. And they thought that they were worried that species were going to be moving um, to, towards the poles and some of the species in their protected area were going to move out of their protected area and they wanted to invest and they'd been given money from a donor to invest in a monitoring program to determine the impact of climate change on their marine protected area. And I, for a while I thought about that and then I started thinking of what they could monitor and there's obvious things to monitor, the species that may be at this, this is in the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern end of their distribution could be disappearing. But then I also slept on it and thought, why? It's a very popular thing at the moment to look at the impact of climate change on species. Uh, and that's good and it's interesting and it's important. Um, but in this particular case, for the management of their protected area, what are they going to do? If species at the southern end of their distribution move north and they move out of their reserve, how are they going to, are they going to put up a fence to stop the fish moving or the birds or the algae? So really, I ask the question, what's the point of monitoring something that you can do nothing about? And uh, I asked them that, they didn't like the question. They said they had the money to monitor this thing. I said, well, I could think of some things to monitor that maybe could change actions. So bottom line is, I was saying, if you can't tell me how the science and monitoring could actually change what you do in your marine protected area, I don't know why you're doing it. So the species move north, they disappear. What are you going to do about it? And I've had that conversation now with a dozen different groups of people all around the world, NGOs, particularly in state governments. Why are they monitoring the impact of climate change if there's nothing they can do about it? And I think we have enough polar bear stories to convince the world that, yes, climate change threatens biodiversity. We don't need any more of those stories. So I actually convinced them to take a cost effectiveness approach and look at monitoring things they could do something about which would be the impact of poaching on their marine protected area. Uh, so they could start looking at the size of fish, the impact of nutrients that are coming off the, the local villages and the cities and towns. And that was something they could monitor the nutrients and the growth of algae. And then they could go in and lobby, use that data to lobby the local municipalities to sort out some of their sewage and stormwater runoff. So there were things they could monitor where data could actually change management or policy. So the poaching, they could have more anti-poaching patrols. So again, and then I used the cost effectiveness approach to deliver them monitoring strategies that would most effectively and quickly tell them that those things were happening. The second example was work we did with Michelle Lee, who was a Oxford PhD student and she worked with us a bit and she was interested in terrestrial protected areas in Gabon. But they had a bit of a ter terrestrial protected area system. The, the people who run the country of Gabon are quite interested in conservation and were interested in ex expanding that protected area system and that's still ongoing. And she was under lots of pressure to get more and more data on the distribution of species and the taxonomy of species and find out more about the details of, of things like invertebrates and trees. So I said, well, how much a difference would all that extra spatial data, and this is a very popular activity in ecology, people gathering more and more information. Um, Half Earth is an entire organisation dedicated to gathering more information about where species are so that they can build more informed protected area systems. And we have often asked in our group, how much difference does more data on the distribution of species make? And usually not much. Well, in Gabon, we don't know a lot. 
I mean, it is a, is a, it's a relatively understudied part of the world. It's the size of France. It's huge and enormously diverse. There must be gaps. There are huge gaps in our knowledge. So then the question was, where should you go? And the immediate answer from an ecologist or a taxonomist would be, let's go to places where nobody's been before. Um, and I said, well, is that going to be the information that's most likely to change your, your terrestrial protected area system, most likely to alter the decisions you make? And I said, probably not. Let's look at your species distribution models and then actually change them and see how much changes to the species distribution modelling affects the protected area design. And we fiddled around with that and we found out that the best places to go are places where the the spatial planning was very uncertain whether a site was a priority or not. So we do marks and analyses, and we find some places were always protected regardless of the data. Some places were never protected regardless of the data. And some places were sort of in or out, and they were 50-50, and we weren't sure whether they should be protected or not. And I said, they're the places you should go, particularly if those places are uncertain if they should be protected, and also had very little previous data. So in fact, you couldn't work out, most importantly, where the most important data gaps were without running through the entire decision science analysis process. Because you can't then, if you haven't gone through the decision science analysis process, you don't know how much different, difference certain kinds of data from certain places will make. And of course, one of my other bugbears in, in conservation, particularly marine conservation, is people just love um, tagging things and working out where they go. And they usually there's a lot of that study. Tagging and, and monitoring species and catching them uh, is a popular activity and they're working out their movement patterns, both seasonal, diurnal, dispersal patterns. Always seems to be important and it's generally justified on, on how it informs marine protected areas. It's virtually never been used to design marine protected areas. Um, and I've always asked the question, given that the impact, particularly on threatened species of tagging and catching is negative and causes stress, but also some level of mortality or reduced fecundity, then can you justify all that tagging and catching in terms of how much the difference it would make to marine protected area design? There is some material in the literature that shows how to use dispersal and movement data in designing marine protected areas but very rarely is that implemented in practice. So again, thousands and thousands of papers are tagging animals, and I'm still not quite sure whether the impact has been significant. So that's the stuff that generally, when I'm an Ecological Society of America meeting or talking to a university, wherever it is in the world, has an already annoyed 90% of the audience. So then I say there's a sort of, what I seem to be to be science for the sake of science, not science for the sake of outcomes. And then I thought, well, what are the reasons to monitor and do science? And after lots of thought and lots of decisions, I should have acknowledged that all this thinking about the value of information and the value of mo monitoring and science for conservation comes from innumerable conversations with uh, people in CBCS, uh, particularly um, Eve uh, McDonald Madden, but um, uh, plenty of others. Uh, I won't go through all of them because it's dozens and dozens of people. And it all actually stemmed from a workshop on Stradbroke Island in about 2006 and 2007 when I, we gathered together a group of us to ask this sort of question. And even then, we actually started to try to classify how different sorts of data could be used for making decisions, not just for gaining knowledge. And so these are sort of our classifications. I won't necessarily run through them all, but I'll note that it, what I'm generally going to talk about is uh, uh, largely three and four. So three and four is where information actually enables us to build better system models about and models about where things are and how things work so that we can then make better decisions. Of course, adaptive management is a slightly advanced version of that where you make the decision, you continue to gather data, and then you revise the decisions you make. So monitoring and science is heavily embedded in the active adaptive management process. Building system models requires some sort of data. Up the top are two very sort of, you'd call them uh, slightly more mundane reasons to collect data. Sometimes people give you money 
to deliver conservation outcomes and they want to know whether you took the actions and the outcomes were delivered. I say it's mundane, it's not, it's not high level science, however it's very important and it's very rarely done. So often we want to audit um, polluters, we want to audit conservation organisations for the delivery of the actions we pay them for. That's important, it's not always that exciting. State dependent management is a very practical form of monitoring. Uh, to give you a very specific example of state de manage dependent management that informs actions, often in certain sensitive fisheries where there's a bycatch of a threatened species, like in New Zealand, it's Hector's dolphin. So they catch fish and every now and then they catch a Hector's dolphin, which is a, is a, is a, a listed threatened species and has a very small population. If more than, I think, one or two of dolphins are caught in the season, the entire fishery closes down. So to me, that's a, a perfect example of, of monitoring that's highly tied to a decision and an action. You know exactly what the monitoring does and you know exactly what action to take when a certain amount of data comes in. We have caught two hectares dolphins, the fishery is closing down. So one cannot doubt the value of monitoring under those circumstances. The ones down the bottom are a little bit more nebulous reasons to do science and monitoring. Number five is, of course, basic science. We need to understand the way the world works. And, and of course, that sort of science, although it's not practically useful in the very short term, it is amazing how often basic science eventually becomes useful, except the time frame maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 years. But there's other forms of information. Uh, let me pick on one of my own, our own favourite projects from our group is the Threatened Species Index. So the Threatened Species Index, which is assembling data and creating an index, that's not specifically informing any particular action that people are taking. It's not part of an active adaptive management. That said, the Threatened Species Index uh, has already been used by NGOs and, and our own Martin. Uh, to inform the uh, review of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, because Graham Samuels was mesmerised by Martins showing him the threatened species index on a screen in his office, which meant that any of his questions about how Australia's threatened vertebrates going, uh, in that case it was mammals and plants, were put to bed. They're going really, really badly. And tens, thousands and thousands of time series prove that, and that visualisation and assembly of that data is informing both politicians, public policy and the general public because it's out there in the media as well quite often. So, again, it's not informing a very specific conservation action, but it's informing general public opinion, which eventually form, follows through, we hope, into changes of policy. That process, of course, can be very slow. I'd also like to uh, have a nod to citizen science, one of the most the best way to get people advocating for nature is to engage them, in, engage them in the process of data collection and for them to be part of seeing the declines uh, and or changes in abundance of species around them. And, and that's a powerful tool of engagement and training. Uh, finally, serendipity. Sometimes we just monitor stuff. Uh, for example, a lot of the bird monitoring in the United States over a long period of time by professionals and volunteers was underpinned Rachel Carson's Silent Spring book, which had a massive change on US policy on pesticides and chemicals. So often we don't actually even know why we're monitoring stuff. We're just taking the pulse of the earth, so a general health check on the planet, and, and you discover interesting things, acid rain, CO2 levels, are all things where people monitored them for a very long time without necessarily a very specific purpose, but ultimately that long-term basic monitoring of the health of the planet uh, has had enormous impacts on management and policy. Uh, let me just sort of point out why are we in such a mess with the justification of monitoring? And it comes probably largely from the way that we are trained as ecologists and biologists, and we are trained in a classical null hypothesis framework. And I don't know exactly what happens at first and second year level when we're taught statistics, but typically when we're taught statistics, we thought you should have a null hypothesis, and then you should gather data, and you can potentially reject that null hypothesis or not reject that whole null hypothesis. So, um, how do you then 
move that into an applied circumstance, and this is what a power anal analysis would be for a classical statistician, and now we're testing the statistical power of an investment in a monitoring strategy. So let's say, for example, we're trying to work out whether a pesticide or some land management activity like logging was likely to be having an impact on a listed threatened species. It might be a mussel in a river or it might be a black cockatoo in a forest. Um, what a classical statistician will then do is when they look at the issue of optimal monitoring, they will devise um, several monitoring strategies. And we have two here, the blue one and the purple one, which is some combination of going to sites and spending time in those sites. They'll gather a bit of pilot data and they'll, they'll work out uh, that how much more money, the x-axis here is money, how much more money you spend on each of those different strategies, different kinds of monitoring strategies. One could be, for example, aerial surveys versus ground surveys. Um, what is the probability that you detect a real change? And that's what is statistical power. So there happens to be a real change in the organism you're looking at, the abundance of, say, kangaroos or moose. You want to see if there is a real change in those species. How much money do you need to spend to get a certain level of statistical power? And therefore, they call this optimal monitoring because if you had a fixed amount of money, you could work out the best monitoring strategy. That is the one that gives you the most likelihood of detecting a change if there is a real change. At the moment, of course, we're assuming we'll only reject the null hypothesis with a probability of 5%. So we're taking a classical view that you only want to reject the null hypothesis when you're 95% sure. Or they might say, uh, if you want a certain level of statistical power, like you want to be 80% sure that you reject a false null hypothesis, and that's the statistical power you want, which of those two monitoring strategy gives you that ability to reject a false null hypothesis with an 80% probability, and which is the cheapest one, which in this case would be the purple strategy. So that's if, if one was to go to a, st a classical statistician and ask them, how do I do an optimal monitoring method for uh, testing the impact of uh, an environmental impact on a threatened species? This is what they would do, and they still do that. Now, even this is quite hard and complicated. But I would say it's sort of wrong. And the reason why it's wrong is we're sticking uh, alpha uh, type uh, type one error down at five percent that is we will only reject a null hypothesis um, uh, f falsely five percent of the time now i won't labor the point too much and you it's a difficult thing to explain without a white whiteboard but what we typically do is uh, we assume that the activity is not impacting our conservation asset or threatened species there's two types of error uh, uh, the, the type one error says we reject the null hypothesis when we shouldn't have, and the other type of error is we, we accept the null hypothesis when we shouldn't have. That's a type two error, and we don't do those things. In a sense, at the moment, we're, we're setting uh, the whole process heavily in favour of accepting or not rejecting the null hypothesis. So we really want to be very, the whole system of basic science is you really want to reject a null hypothesis very, very rarely if, uh, by error. So let me give you an example how this happens in practice. So often in Australia, when we were fighting forestry debates in the mid-90s, what would often happen is they would say, forestry doesn't impact black cockatoos. We've gone to five sites where there is logging and we found three birds and we went to five sites where there was no logging and we found seven birds. And we've done our statistical analysis, we can't reject the null hypothesis that logging has no impact. And then they make the leap of faith and they'd say, therefore logging has no impact. And that's wrong. Not rejecting a null hypothesis is not the same as accepting a null hypothesis. But you would know that if there were only five sites and they found three birds and five sites and they found seven birds where there was no logging, three birds where there was logging, there's no hope of rejecting that null hypothesis because your statistical 
power is diddly squat. Uh, so we propose in this paper by Scott Field that you should actually set your type one and type two errors to be equal or to be the cost of the two sorts of error. So I strongly recommend you have a look at that paper, uh, which tells you about a different way of doing optimal monitoring and decision making in these, in these environmental uh, management cases. Let me sort of just go through another few verbal examples of, of from, from our group over the last 15 years of how we've studied um, how much monitoring should happen in different circumstances for conservation outcomes. In fact, we started this, as I say, as early as 2005, 2006. We didn't know there was a name for this, and it's called value of information analysis. It wasn't until, I think, about 2010 when we were hooking up with USGS people. I don't know if they invented the name, but they call it value of information analysis. And then we realised we we co-invented the idea of value of information analysis for conservation problems. Let me give you a couple of examples. One of my favourite ones is Headley's work. So Headley was looking at um, protected area design in South Africa, uh, the Fangos area, arguably the most plant biodiverse part of the entire planet. I think it's 9,000 endemic plants in a tiny area. Um, huge diversity. And we asked the question, how much information on proteas should we wait to collect before we started building a protected area system? So let's imagine it was 1970, there was very little protected areas, habitat is being destroyed, and we want to build a protected area system, but we had very little data on where different species were. Proteas are like South African banksias, if you like, there's about 400 species. And we have to, to have this incredible data set from Tony Rebello, who had, who had gathered together data on all those 400 species from thousands of locations across the Fangos in South West South Africa. So what we did, Headley did, is he said, well, let's pretend we'll build the reserve system without any data on where the species are, and then we'll build it based purely on environmental factors, and then we'll destroy habitat. And after about 50 years, we'll see how well we protected the proteas. And he found that if you did that, you actually had adequate conservation of about 90% of the protea species, 80 or 90% of the protea species. Um, then he said, if we had all the data that we now have, these thousands and thousands of data sets, we would have protected something like 98 to 99% of the protea species. So, so clearly data is good. I'm not disputing data is not good. However, let's imagine in 1970 that instead of building our reserve system, we waited to get more data and we assume we start off with no data. How many years would you wait? And we worked out that for a reasonable amount of money and a certain number of protea experts, we could collect data at a certain number of plots per year and we would gather those plots, I think it was a couple, a thousand or so plots a year. How many years would we do that data collection before we made the reserve system? And of course, what we're losing out on is as time is passing, habitat's being destroyed. So some of our options are being taken away. What we're gaining is a better understanding of the species distribution of all those species. And therefore we could put into our spatial planning exercise. And we found, in fact, distressingly, it was really only a couple of years of data it was worth waiting for. And you don't need, you know, we only needed 10% of the actual data they had to make a decision that was almost as good as having all the data. So I suppose the lesson I, we learned from that is if somebody says, stop this work, this applied conservation work, let's wait till we get more data. In general, I would say, no do the activities, the conservation activities you need to do now, because waiting for more data is very unlikely in many circumstances to improve your decision. And this is particularly relevant when the data is stopping the decision. And that's exactly the same example as Peter Baxter worked on for destroying fire ants. When we looked at, should we wait to do fire ant controls while we spend our money actually understanding the niche of fire ants and their distribution a whole heap better? Yes, wait maybe one or two years. Um, there's a lot of examples there. One of my other favourite examples is Yadine's paper on um, Sumatran tigers. 
And there we ask the question, if you were managing a big protected area in Sumatra, where you confidently knew there were some tigers, but as you were managing it and your anti-poaching patrols are out there looking around for poachers, and after about 10 or 15, how long would you wait without seeing any evidence of any tigers before you said that you should either stop the anti-poaching patrols because the tigers had gone, or you should invest in an intensive monitoring activity. So we'll assume that while they're doing their anti-poaching patrols, there's always a small chance they could see signs or come across a tiger, but it's very unlikely their primary purpose is looking for poachers. And we thought, oh, well, maybe after, if you had a big national park and the main reason you had that national park was for a species that nobody had seen for three or four years, you'd be sort of thinking, gee, I think the tigers aren't there. We better go in and do some intensive monitoring, or maybe we should be monitoring all the time. The odd thing was with the information and data we have, it's still optimal to do anti-poaching, even if you hadn't seen the tigers for a very long time, and the probability they were there was getting quite low. And only then, after quite a few years, and when the probability of the tigers still persisting was very low, would you have two or three years of intensive monitoring. And if you still didn't find them, then you'd abandon the hope the tigers were there and you would cease the anti-poaching patrols, assuming that was the only reason you were doing them for tigers. So again, our intuition that monitoring, continuous monitoring of threatened species is essential to do management of activities is, was false. If, if you are managing a park for a particular suite of threatened species and you're not even sure they're there, you should probably keep managing them on the assumption they are there for quite a long time before you start to panic and invest in intensive monitoring just to find whether they're there or not. And I think that I'm not sure that message is fully, fully got through to a lot of the people doing those things and partly because it's a counterintuitive message. Uh, there's a few of the papers we've done on this sort of value of information analysis over the years. I strongly recommend Mike Runge's paper, which is a little bit mathematical, but really sets up the framework of value of information analysis. Um, just to sort of maybe end with, uh, before we go to questions, one last sort of point. This is a fairly generic, so I've given you some very specific examples, and most of our work has been very much example by example. And in fact, unfortunately, despite we've worked on many problems where we've asked the question about how much monitoring and science is needed to make a good decision and how much money you should spend on that science, we actually always get different answers. So there's no sort of magical rule of thumb that 10% of your budget should be spent on science and monitoring or when you're trying to discover something, you should always only spend two or three years on it. Sometimes you spend a long time, sometimes you spend a little time. Sometimes you should spend no time on monitoring. You should just go and to take actions. And one of these papers outlines that very well. What I'm going to do is give you a general argument for this, which I think is useful for managers. So um, often, uh, when we're managing a threatened species or an ecosystem, the first thing we want to know is uh, how beneficial will a management strategy be? And then when we work out how beneficial that management strategy is, let's say it's weed control or feral predator control or protected area, expanding a protected area, we find that the benefit of that strategy changes if one of the parameters of our system changes. So for a lot of threatened species work, one of the most uncertain parameters is the longevity or the death mortality rates of adult individuals. Uh, if the mortality rates of adult individuals go up and down two or 3%, the benefits of conservation strategies can vary enormously. So typically a scientist says, well, we really need to know more about that uncertain parameter because look, uh, if that uncertain parameter, whatever that is, the mortality rate is high, the benefit of the strategy is high. If it's low, the benefit of the strategy is much lower. We should really know that. So rule number one is if there's only one thing you can do and there's no other strategy, you don't need to resolve the uncertainty around that parameter. You just take the action. That's sort of obvious. If there's only one thing you can do, do it. And in the case of the climate change and the marine protected areas, when there's nothing you can do, do that as well, do nothing. There's only one thing you can do, spend all your money doing on it. You don't need to do any monitoring and science. 
But of course, that's a very simple situation. Invariably, there's two strategies. Let's say we're trying to uh, save a threatened bird population and we might want to do uh, feral predator control or we want to do changing the fire regime or some vegetation management. Well, the first thing to do is rather than resolving the uncertain parameter, one can actually just see whether one strategy is always better than the other. And in this particular case, changing fire management may always be better than feral predator control. And it does, that, that uncertain parameter, its value doesn't influence which strategy is best. And if that's the case, so you have to go through the whole decision-making process. If that's the case, you don't need to resolve that uncertain parameter. You don't need to do any more science, just do the best strategy because it's always the best strategy. And it is remarkable how often we've found that. I think one of Sean Maxwell's paper uh, uncovers that for koalas. We don't know need to know a lot more about certain aspects of koala biology to determine which is the best strategy for koala conservation. So that's again a little bit sort of duh, isn't this obvious? But it's amazing how often people want to resolve these uncertain parameters because it affects their outcome. Affecting the outcome is very different from affecting the decision. And all we can do is make a decision. So let, if the decision doesn't change, Let's just do what's best. More interestingly is when the thing we don't know, if we knew more about it, it would change what we do. So in this case, if that uh, adult mortality rate is higher, we would do strategy A. If it was lower, we'd do strategy B. But the difference in the outcome is tiny. And all the money we might spend on the science to resolve that uncertain parameter uh, may be much greater than we could just do more of one of those two strategies and lift up that blue or green line. So maybe we could take all the money from science, allocate it to more uh, management, move our favourite strategy, let's say strategy A, up so it goes another centimetre up on that graph, and then strategy A is better than strategy B just because we're doing more of it. So you don't need to resolve the uncertainty when the benefits of resolving the uncertainty are tiny. And finally is the interesting case, and this is the case for science and monitoring. This is the case where if we can't work out what that parameter is, then we could make a terrible mistake and we could choose strategy B when strategy A is far, far better or vice versa. So my argument is if you're really doing management of threatened species or threatened ecosystems or particular conservation issues, and you arguing for more science, you need to be able to prove that you would actually have a much better outcome if you could resolve the uncertainty. So the sort of the rules of thumb are, um, and I haven't given all the reasons to do science, but this is one of them. Um, if you do science, for example, one of the other reasons to do science is you actually, while you're doing the science, you actually discover a new action. So sometimes people are out there monitoring species and they just see stuff and they think of stuff that wouldn't have happened if they weren't out in the field. So can there be a new action and is it a feasible alternative? So that's sort of sometimes a reason to do monitoring and science. But if there isn't likely to be a new possible action, uh, it, it, what is the chance then that amongst the alternative actions you have that the research is going to change what you do? And if, you, if there is very little chance that the research is going to change what you do, then you don't need to do the research. And then finally, even if the research might have a small impact on what you do, is that expected benefit outweigh the cost of all the science? And could have you invested that invest that science money into management money. And that's what is a classical value of information analysis, which is a very harsh, it's a very harsh microscope to put conservation science under and very rarely done. And you might also ask me, what is the value of a value of information analysis? Um, that would be a good question because that takes time and money. Um, I think I've said all that. And there's Eve, one of Eve's key papers uh, that's in Trends in Ecology Evolution that talks about when we should be monitoring and when we shouldn't be monitoring and has some case studies in it. Um, 
I won't go through these things, but I'll point out that in both the Gabon and the Gulf of Mexico examples, we did come up with monitoring and science strategies that were optimised to deliver better outcomes. Um, I haven't talked about active adaptive management, and that's a whole talk in its own right. So I refer you to a paper by Mick and I a long time ago about what is active adaptive management. And the, the key difference is most of what I've been talking about says the science and the monitoring is separate from the management. So you're either managing or you're monitoring and doing science. And they're two different activities. Many times they're not different activities, they're happening simultaneously. And in that case, you need to start looking at the notion of adaptive and active adaptive management. Um, these are my summary points. Um, let me tell you the flaws in my talk. First of all, uh, I've assumed that monitoring and science can only deliver outcomes for the problem we're currently addressing. So if we're looking at managing a threatened species in a particular location, then the science we do helps that species in that location. That said, often science done on one species in one place helps other species in different places. And so there are value of information cases to be made for transferability of science to other places. Um, let me think of a great example of that was what's been going on in Tasmania, where they've been trying to, I'll get this wrong, they're going to help 40 spotted padlotes where the chicks, I think, have been killed by lice, and they've put out um, insecticide-infused nesting material. So the 40 spotted padlotes collect this cotton and thread that's full of insecticides. They put it in their nest. And they make a nest that has insecticides in it, and that kills the lice. That then means the little 40 spotted padlote chicks mature. That science was first done in Brazil, uh, I think. And, uh, and that is a clever piece of science for a particular species that is actually beneficial to multiple species. So if you can put a case that the science you're doing has more general validity, that's good. Um, one of the final things I would just say is that one of the, the evil techniques sometimes that politicians use to stop us taking conservation activities or stop us doing bad things is saying the science isn't settled. And this, of course, happens in the climate change world. It happened in the world of logging. It happens in the world of marine protected areas. So the argument there is, hey, guys, we're not going to build marine protected areas because we don't know if they work. We're not going to do anything about climate change. because We don't know if it's going to be happening. We're not going to um, uh, do... Um, reduce the pollutants going into the sea because we haven't got definitive proof it's a problem. Uh, so you need to go and do more science. The danger with that is the scientists are sort of happy because they get $10 million and five more years to go and do more science. Of course, um, that also keeps them quiet, stops them complaining. They feel as though they're doing something, but the actual fundamental problem is not in being addressed. And we're, we're assuming that there's no problem we're accepting the null hypothesis that there is no problem. And accepting the null hypothesis is, is not a good thing to be doing. So in marine protected areas, when people say, prove to me they work, I say, prove to me that you can fish in perpetuity forever without having any impact on the environment. Both of them are equally hard to prove. But who, who gets to ask the question first often has the power. And there's the questions and there's my emails. My TNC email doesn't work anymore. And I'll leave you on that slide and I'm happy to answer any questions.